everyone to the February 10th City Council work session. Welcome to everybody here and at home. We have two important topics to discuss today. The first one is a work session on town and gown briefing. Hi. Thanks, Mayor. I'm Sarah Maderi, Assistant City Manager. And as part of my role as the Assistant City Manager, I've been asked to, um, and in fact, when I was first hired, asked to really uh, elevate our relationship with the university and work closer with them on our partnerships between the city and university. And so since that time, I've been meeting once a month with the Community Relations Manager for the University of Oregon, which was Greg Rickoff and is now uh, Karen Hyatt, who's here in the audience. And uh, there's a couple of pieces of information. You can see why this is really important because we have a lot of students. They have a big, um, they're a big influence in the community. The university is a, a great economic engine for our community. There's a lot of talent and innovation and ideas and creativity coming. And um, and the reason why I'd ask for a couple of these maps is that I think oftentimes people think of the near campus neighborhoods as being really the emphasis of where students are. And indeed, there is a lot of density there and activity, but. Uh, the large 11 by 17 map shows that we have students um, really sprinkled throughout the community in Eugene and Springfield. And then the other pamphlet that's at your, at your table shows kind of numbers of employees and numbers of students by ward. And I just think it's a, a good reminder that students and employees and the University of Oregon has a, a, a pretty wide, uh, probably county impact. So uh, the idea of the town count briefing really came out of trying to inform you a little bit more about the things that are happening and the things we're working on. And I know that one of the topics that's been of high interest has been the university's uh, recent work on sexual violence, sexual prevention. And so today, I'm really honored to be able to introduce Dr. Robin Holmes, who's joining us from the University of Oregon. Uh, Dr. Holmes became Vice President for Student Life in July of 2007. She is a licensed clinical psychologist and has worked at the Nouveau since 1992. I beat you by a year. Uh, she served as Dean of Students and Director of the University Counseling and Testing Center prior to her appointment as Vice President. Dr. Holmes leads the university's efforts in support of students' academic success and oversees the Career Center, the Counseling and Testing Center, the Dean of Students Office, the Herb Memorial Union, the University Health Center, the Holden Center for Leadership and Community Engagement, University Housing, and everything else, Department of Physical Education and Recreation. She does a lot of things uh, with students, and I'm really excited to have her here today to present. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate being here. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, for uh, for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Um, oftentimes, at the university, uh, we talk about us being a kind of a city within in the city. So um, it makes sense for us to have such great relationships that we enjoy with the city of Eugene and Springfield, and working very closely with with many of you. And so, as Sarah mentioned, um, I was asked. Was it? actually quite interesting because I found out about this meeting a couple of weeks ago from Karen Hyatt and one of my colleagues, actually I think Jamie uh, Moffat was here, and some folks asked about, hey, come back and talk a little bit about what's going on with your efforts regarding sexual assault prevention, and somehow I'm here and Jamie's not here, so she's, she's a master that way, uh, that uh, there's a little bit of a, <laughs> I don't know, it worked out okay though, and I I'm really am happy uh, to be here. Now, as, as most of you are certainly aware, um, sexual misconduct is a problem on colleges, campuses across the nation. Um, the University of Oregon is not immune from those uh, problems and issues, and we've been doing quite a bit to address those issues, and it takes all of us to really work effectively and efficiently on, on these issues. And so I just want to share with you a little bit about what we have been um, doing. Um, it's very important to us uh, to stop all forms of sexual misconduct. It's a priority at the U of O at all levels, uh, from the university president and his leadership team to the faculty, to the staff, to the students. Uh, we have a lot of interest in this area and a lot of very dedicated uh, individuals who are spending a lot of time doing their best um, to bring the resources that we need and make the campus safe and respectful for all. Eighteen months ago, uh, we launched a series of reviews of our infrastructure, our policies, and, and all of our processes related to Title IX. Now, Title IX is the law that relates to our prevention and response efforts regarding sexual misconduct. All schools are um, subject to that particular law or title. And we really needed to critically examine what was working, what wasn't working, and what we needed to do in order to impact our campus culture really for uh, the good. So we completed that series of reviews. 
Uh, there was an internal review uh, that our faculty senate led. There was an external review that we had by bringing in an outside group of experts. And then, <laughs> then there was a gap analysis that was completed uh, by my staff and student life. And, and we learned a lot, including that we were doing a lot of things really very well. But we also learned that there was some work to do and, and some areas where we just needed to get better. So since that time, we've increased our infrastructure significantly, our coordination, our communication, our collaborations, and we've invested in a number of new initiatives. I want to tell you a little bit about, about some of those. We have more than doubled our resources for sexual assault prevention and response, including three staff members now dedicated to prevention and three staff for response, um, that uh, they respond after an assault occurs in order to support our students. And this is a significant increase in staffing compared to our staffing just five years ago. We significantly increased our awareness and education, especially for our students, about our processes, resources, and services. Last July, we relaunched our SAFE website, which is safeuoregon.edu, with new and additional functions and information that's really helping better communicate our services more clearly to our students in need. And we know that that's working because the amount of students who are coming to that website has gone up dramatically. In September, we also launched a new prevention website, prevention.uoregon.edu. There's a theme with the UOregon part with a focus of educating campus on efforts related to student prevention programs, education initiatives, training opportunities, and awareness campaigns. The content for the student site is, is designed really to let students, faculty, and staff know about opportunities and ways that they can actually get involved in our prevention education efforts. Research has shown that one of the best ways to educate and engage students in these issues is really peer-to-peer -peer education. They learn best from each other. So we're doing a lot more of that in all of our efforts. Both of the new websites, both SAFE and Prevention, are mobile responsive, so students can easily access that information on their phones or any other device 24-7. Um, young folks really are attached to that phone, and so making it mobile friendly was really important. In addition, we've produced a paper booklet of some of the information from our safe site. I'll hand that out before I leave for those of us who prefer, prefer that format still. We're solidifying our partnerships. This is critically important for us because some incidents involve both criminal and administrative processes. We've, we have an MOU with the city that facilitates the coordination between the university and both the UO, the Eugene Police Department and the DA's office. Our student conduct code has been extended allowing us to more easily respond to off-campus incidents, and the revised code gives us much more flexibility to respond to incidents wherever that they, they may occur. We've updated our standard operating procedures to detail the process of how sexual assault reports are handled by the university, from receiving the information to investigating reports and appealing the decisions, with an eye toward reducing the time that it takes us to investigate incidents and reduce the number of times that our students have to retell their story of the incident. In our new prevention model, the role of the prevention staff member is to teach our students how to recognize, act, and intervene, something that we call and others call bystander awareness. It's important that our students understand that active consent, what that is, that they realize how to think about their own boundaries, and that they know ways to act on those and that they can intervene when they see that something isn't right. We also start setting expectation and increasing awareness even before our students arrive on campus. We know that there's a connection between alcohol and sexual misconduct, so since 2012, all incoming students under the age of 21 have been required to complete an online program that's designed to inform them about responsible alcohol behaviors and sexual violence issues. Our online program, which is called HAVEN, informs students about healthy sexuality and the role of consent. Students must pass with an 80% or higher on this test. Students who don't complete this have the registration blocked for winter term, so they can't register until they get done. Now in its third year, Haven, we've been very pleased to have our highest completion rate ever. So before classes even started this year, we already had a 99% completion rate. So our students really are taking this online module and getting that information right away before they even hit campus. Each year we put on a theater-based program called It Can't Be Rape for all incoming students during summer and fall orientations. And it focuses on demonstrating techniques to intervene, clarify uh, healthy sexual behavior, and establishing a definition of consent. 
After the performance, students meet in their small orientation groups and have a follow-up discussion facilitated by their trained student orientation leaders. Again, getting back to that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, modeling I was talking about earlier. And it's much more comfortable for our students to talk about these topics in a smaller group setting. This fall, we launched a new bystander intervention program called Get Explicit. I'm really excited uh, about this new program that was completely developed by our own U of O staff and students from scratch. Get Explicit is a peer-to-peer -peer program for first-year students who live in the residence halls and includes case study style interactive activities including videos that demonstrate expectations and appropriate behaviors. We trained over 150 of our RAs to help facilitate this program under the guidance of our prevention staff and all 4,000 of our students who live in the residence hall were able to participate in that program. We began developing and retooling our existing training model for subpopulations like athletes, international students, and fraternians for early life students, but the trainings are much more relevant to our different student groups. All current members of Fraternity and Sorority Life, as well as all of our athletic teams, now attend a training that includes information on consent, expectations, and bystander intervention. We work with the parents, too. During summer orientation, parents attended a safety presentation with a panel of speakers from many areas of the campus. The presentation is designed to walk them through how to talk with their students about sexual assault and other challenging topics such as alcohol and, and drug use. Parents are very appreciative of having that opportunity for that training. On the infrastructure side, we recently hired Darcy Heroy, who is our new interim associate vice president and Title IX coordinator. Darcy's been providing project coordination for our Title IX management team since last April, helping us to track the university's Title IX initiatives coming from those reviews I mentioned earlier, and creating a framework for a comprehensive strategic plan on sexual assault prevention and response. We're really pleased that she has agreed to continue with this at the senior level for uh, this year. Um, and as AVP Title IX coordinator, she's going to really help us to coordinate all of our efforts going forward. I'm very, very proud of the work that we're doing on campus. If we had more time, I could list many, many more activities that we're doing and that our students are participating in, but I think that gives you a flavor of some of the comprehensive nature of what's been happening. We're also contributing on a national level. Uh, one of our students was recently selected as one of 15 members of an inaugural student advisory group um, for the National It's On Us campaign. We're really excited for that student and what they will be able to bring back to us from that effort. And our theater-based Rehearsals for Life team received a NASPA Student Affairs Professionals in Higher Education Gold Excellence Award for their work this year. So not only are they doing really great things, but it's being recognized at the national level as well. So I hope that you can see that we are working diligently on sexual assault prevention and response. Uh, we're also looking very carefully to understand if what we're doing is actually making a difference. Um, you understand as being part of state government that if something's not working or it's not making a difference, you need to stop doing that and spending that money and doing something else. So we are putting in very robust assessment efforts to help us to evaluate our programs and evaluate that uh, effectiveness. We're also lucky to be at a Research One university. So we have faculty who um, have research interests in this area and we're engaging with all of them um, as well to think about best practices. We want our students to live and learn in an environment that is free from sexual misconduct. But if a student is assaulted, we want them to know that they will be supported and protected, that they have choices, that the, our processes are fair and timely. So I thank you for this time to give you an update on where the University of Oregon has been working very dil diligently. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, and I do hope that you will continue to invite us back so we can interact together um, as part of this great city to make sure that our students, such an important part of in the backbone of this city, are safe and having a great experience at, the, at Eugene. Thank, thank you, you very much. And I'll leave uh, for these comments. Yeah, and stuff great. Yeah. Um, Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, thank you for coming, Robin. Um, I'd been asking for this work session for quite a, a long time, prompted in part by the, the surveys that showed that 10% or so of, of U of O women students were sexually assaulted. And uh, that means about 2,000 people are, 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 are being assaulted. And that's an astounding number, actually. Uh, it was very disturbing to me. Uh, and it's not, uh, and, and these folks aren't just students. Mm -hmm. They are 
members of our community and citizens of Eugene, so that makes it our problem too. Uh, and uh, I would like to explore ways that we can partner better mm -hmm. uh, in helping with that. Um, I appreciate all the efforts that you've mm -hmm. done, and, and, and there's a lot of things going on, but we really couldn't tell because we didn't hear about it. Mm -hmm. I heard about it because the U of O is in my ward, right. so I pay attention to that. Uh, and, and I live right near campus. Um, uh, and, but there was a lot of stuff that was going on at the same time. You had the survey and you had the U of O basketball assault, sexual assault, which I think was not handled very well, frankly. Uh, and uh, so I, I guess the first question I have for you is what are the metrics that you are putting in place to tell that all the stuff that you're doing mm -hmm. is actually working? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the real metric is lower number of salts. Mm -hmm. 2,000 is just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So what is it that, uh, how can you tell if, you're, if your efforts are making a difference? Mm -hmm. Yes, great questions. First, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to correct your numbers because they actually are not, they're not right. They're, that's too low. It's actually one in five, and that's a national number. And this, the various surveys that we've had at the university show that our numbers are exactly the same as the national numbers, one in five. So instead of 10 percent, it's actually 20 percent. And we all should be astounded by that, that there, there are that many incidents of sexual assault or unwanted contact in our community is, is absolutely mind-boggling. And when you do things like you're in a group of, of people or a group of students, let's say you're, you have 100 students in a room with you, and you look at those students, you think of how many of them are going to be assaulted. That's when it really starts to, to hit home and, and why we have to redouble our efforts. And I would completely agree with you, uh, Councilman Zelenka, that the university has not done a good job of communicating all the things that we're doing to try and prepare students to prevent sexual assault from ever occurring. Because once it occurs... We're on a whole different trajectory. You, you can't unring that bell. And yes, we can provide a lot of services, and we do, and a lot of support afterwards. But we really have to put most of our energy in keeping sexual assault from ever occurring in the first place. And that's a multifaceted um, approach. And it actually begins even be, it has to begin before they even come to college. Um, I think we have to better partner with 4J. And those types of educational efforts really need to be happening in the high schools and in homes even before they get to, uh, to university. Um, in terms of the metrics, you do a variety of things. One, you do, you do things like survey or campus climates to find out what people are thinking, what they're experiencing, and what they're thinking. Um, I think you also, as you're doing these various prevention programs, you try to find out, okay, what were the learning outcomes you were looking for? What did you want them to learn about, whether it was consent or bystander intervention or um, you know, understanding how to safely uh, utilize alcohol? And then you test them on that afterwards to see if they actually learned what you were hoping that they would learn. So that's another metric that you would want to do. But at the end of the day, what you're saying, what you're inter interested in, and we're all interested in, is how do you move that number? And again, I'll point out that is a national number. It's been the same for over 30 years. And so this is not going to be something that's easy or that we have a magic bullet in order to fix. If, if we did, we would. And so would every other university in the United States. That number has stayed exactly the same. Another metric that's very important to us that doesn't get to the incident rates but gets to something else very important, and that is reporting rates. And I can tell you that for this term, for fall term, our reporting rates were up 60% over last year. Now, again, that's, that's disturbing. Thing. You're like, oh, my gosh. This, <clears throat> but it, it's, it's not all a bad thing because it, I don't think the incident rates have gone up 60%. I think that more people, because we're communicating better, because we, you know, we've created ways for students to know how to get into the system, that they are reporting much more. So that's a very good metric for us because that's 60% more students who are getting academic accommodations, who are getting uh, personal counseling and support, are being able to report to the police department if they need to. So those are metrics we look at as well. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for correcting the numbers. One in five means it's probably around six thousand. Mm -hmm. That says twenty-four thousand students at the U of O, approximately. So that that's even worse, but still astounding number. Um, I agree, it's a societal problem. It's mm -hmm. not just a, a, a U of O problem. And the national numbers are the same all over. The, mm -hmm. And uh, and moving that dial is a very complicated and very uh, <laughs> uh, difficult thing to do. It, there's no silver bullet. I'm often right. fond of saying problems don't get solved by silver bullets. They're actually solved with silver <laughs> buckshot. There's a lot of things that you do right. that add up to a big impact. Um, and, and with that in mind, uh, Sarah, maybe you can talk about what the city's doing, 
UPD in particular, but what other in the city? Because this really is a community problem, uh, not only that, but a societal problem at a national level. And it's a difficult thing to do, uh, to deal with, but what are we doing? <laughs> I, I don't know if I have a really good answer for that um, in terms of what the police department is doing. I, I work uh, pretty closely with Karen in terms of making sure that the MOUs are moving along and that we are sharing information because that's one of the big things that we've heard is is an issue. If we if we are sharing information, then we're we're solving uh, issues and predicting issues faster. So I know we've worked a lot on that. Um, you know, across the city, we have other ways that we engage with some of these uh, same youth either through some of the work we do in neighborhoods, but also through um, library, recreation, cultural services, and uh, some of the work that's happening in community centers. So I'd, if, I'd have to get back to you with more specifics on this exact topic, but I think we've mostly been trying to understand the problem and provide support and partnership where we can. I, I will yes. say that, I'm sorry, I, I would say that the, the MOU that we put in place um, has been excellent and that was a lot of hard work, a lot of heavy lifting and I can already attest that for th this year alone the, the um, cooperation and the ease with which we're working uh, uh, among the, the various uh, the police department, the DA's office and, and our offices is just fantastic. It's going really, really well. Another thing the city did is you passed the, the ordinance uh, that really has made a difference regarding the amount of unruly gatherings that are happening in the city. That has been huge, huge, really, really important. Um, I think that it's cutting down on the number of out of control, really large parties. I think students are thinking twice about that. The response is much uh, quicker, and there's a little bit more of, uh, of a hammer if you were going to have these large parties. Because that's when many of these incidents um, occur, or at the large parties off campus. And so that's been very, very helpful, and we're very appreciative of partnering with the city uh, on that particular uh, ordinance. So I think that's been very important. Yeah, it beat me to my next question was how's the, uh, the unruly gathering ordinance are uh, working and, and uh, just an anecdote when we do the welcome where the mayor and I and several other people and you and, mm -hmm. and, and John and other folks walk around and greet the, the new students, one of the things we give them is about the, uh, uh, the unruly gathering um, ordinance and it's almost universal that they've all heard about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because it actually what it did, it was pr very purposeful and exactly did what it was set out to do, which was create an accountability mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it and it and therefore everybody knows about it. Right. And I think it's. Uh, uh, I was surprised <clears throat> the first year after that we instituted that that everybody knew about right. it and it wasn't a, an issue. Uh, so I think that helps a lot too. Uh, and Sarah, I, you know, the reason I asked the question is because I don't think we're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to step that up. Uh, could you share the memo, MOU, uh, with, with the council? Um, but I, I would like to see a list of things that we are doing and then uh, maybe a list of things that we could do more. Uh, it is a societal problem, and, and I think we have a pivotal role in helping move that dial. And if I could also say something that we're looking at as, as a university is to take responsibility for energizing the campus late into the evening. Uh, you probably know if you've been on campus, we are renovating the Urban Moral Union, which is at the heart of campus, and that will be open 24-7. Um, it also allows us to do a lot more social activities actually on the campus, because all the research shows that sexual assaults are much more likely to happen off campus than on campus. So we want students to stay on campus. So one of the things the city could do for to help with this issue is to enliven Eugene. Uh, when I first moved here, I have to admit, from Southern California, which I know is very different, I was really taken aback that by 9 o'clock there wasn't a thing open. Um, there really wasn't anything of a downtown. I know we've been trying to enliven that uh, lately, but there was, really, there was really nothing. So for think about a young person here in Eugene. You know, they're on campus. They do whatever they're doing on campus. We need to be doing more to make that at a really energized and live in place. I can guarantee you we are doing that, and you're going to see a huge difference there uh, over the next couple of years. But the city itself, when, where do students go? What do they do? And if there isn't anything to do in the city, then that's when the large parties, the other types of activities happen that we really don't want them to be uh, engaged in. So the more that the city can enliven Eugene and have things specifically for younger people to do that doesn't necessarily involve alcohol and then some that does involve alcohol for those who are of age, that would be really, really helpful. Good. Thanks. I have um, 
got uh, Councilor Clark, Fryer, Poling, and Brown in the queue. And before I go to you, I just wanted to say to you that um, I, I think the, uh, the work on the student conduct code is really wonderful. It took a lot of a big it, did. it was a big pull to make that happen from everybody. So I'm I'm appreciating that a lot because I think that just helps with the whole community. Mm -hmm. and so I want to express my appreciation to that. And I they can apply off campus. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also wanted to say that um, I think this, um, I know you got your hands very full, but I do think that outreach to the high schools to mm -hmm. sort of engage them in this same um, practice mm -hmm. uh, would be a really good thing to do. And I you agree. have your relationships where you work with them on other things. This mm -hmm. seems like one of the things that, that would be really good to step up on and really try to share the information. You've already gone such a lot of great lengths to um, to gather and the kinds of things that you've done that could be done at an earlier age I think is really Im important as well and I wanted to comment on the numbers because I know in the state of Oregon when I was in the legislature they upped the number of um, uh, people who had to report child abuse mm -hmm. and the numbers went off the charts and everybody was saying, oh, what, what's happening? Why do we have so much more child abuse? And, and as it turns out, we didn't have more. Mm -hmm. We were just actually creating a place for people to actually report what was already right. going on. So I think this that's what happens with things like this. And then you can reduce it because you're you are right. seeing it. You know where it is and you understand it better. So right. I just want to appreciate right. all of that um, a great deal. All right, Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Doctor, thank you very much for the uh, the information and the report on what you're doing. That's uh, a difficult subject these days. It's a very challenging one. I don't envy you the work because I know how it's a, it's a high-tension thing in today's culture, in today's world. Um, I had the fortunate opportunity to return to the university last year and finally finish my degree. So I, I about that. <laughs> haven't, haven't been around there. I can say it's a completely different place than it was and a completely different culture than it was when I was there as a younger person. Mm -hmm. And the challenges are greater, I think. Um, I wonder in this process, um, because I, I read a lot nationally about mm -hmm. this sort of thing and how and, and where the conversation's going. So I wonder about the university's approach or mentality towards this. I wonder, do you see or do you think it's a good idea for a university to return more to kind of a uh, in loco parente sort of role or or is that the kind of conversations you had at first about the appropriate role for the university to take and stuff in mm -hmm. things like this. Mm -hmm. We did have those conversations, but I think the decision was made for us. Uh, with the federal uh, <laughs> yeah. regulations and expectations, we are now we are the local parent again. Um, and so that, that is just what we have to do. Um, and we have had to embrace that uh, because there are so many regulations that point to the fact that we will be held responsible if something does does occur. So in, in local print is, is alive and well uh, on all university campuses again. Hmm. I wonder what kind of conversations or what your metrics are in the process of instituting new policies. And by the way, I think Karen would probably support the idea that I've been one loudly saying I think the student conduct code ought to apply off campus for mm -hmm. a long time. I've been saying that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good thing. Um, but I wonder what you're doing to protect students' due process rights mm -hmm. along in this in this enhancement of, mm -hmm. of, of, of effort. Right. That's a great question and it's very, very important on a variety of levels because first of all, all the students are our students. Whether it's an offend, the offending student or the student who has lots of complaint, they're still all of our students yeah. and we don't forget that. Um, secondly, um, everyone is really afforded due process. And if, if we don't do that, not only is that unfair uh, for for one side of, or the other, but in the, in the long run, whatever you're trying to do, let's say we decide to hold someone responsible uh, with a particular conduct charge, if we don't follow due process, then most likely that's going to be overturned anyway. So it's really not in our interest to violate due process because in the long run it's going to end up uh, not allowing us to do what we think we need to do to protect our <coughs> university um, campus. But first and foremost, I say to everyone, that all the students are our students. People make bad decisions. People make mistakes. Sometimes people are predatory. Yeah. Either way, they need some help, and we need to do what we need to do to protect our community. But we also need to be responsible for all of our students. Thank you. Councilor Fryer. 
Thank you. I really appreciate the presentation and the information. And, and I guess looking at this map, it, all, it, it strikes me that this is not a situation where we are listening to you talk about your problem mm -hmm. and saying, oh, that's really interesting how you're going to deal with your problem. It's, it's not really just your problem. You mentioned a city within a city, mm -hmm. but these people are University of Oregon students but they're also residents of Eugene. So when something happens, it happens to the University of Oregon, but it's also happening to Eugene. Right. And I see the chief is here, um, and I know the chief works closely with our chief mm -hmm. to make sure that, in that within that area of influence, not only with the university, but the areas are around it, mm -hmm. um, that we are ensuring that the students are taking responsibility at the individual level. And I like you outlining what we're doing to work on that individual responsibility element. But there are also social, cultural, and environmental elements that we actually have in common, mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly in the West and South University neighborhoods and the areas immediately around here where uh, they're not on the campus. Right. As you said yourself, they're off campus. And a lot of this activity is occurring off campus. It's occurring within the city of Eugene. Mm -hmm. And while it is your responsibility, it's also our responsibility. And it's something we work on together and we take very seriously. So I, I just wanted to reinforce the fact of how appreciative we are that the University of Oregon wants to be a part of that solution for these residents. And I appreciate how closely the university wants to work with the city to ensure that safety and security is being provided to these people uh, regardless of where they are, whether they're in a residence hall or whether they're in a, an apartment building or, or somewhere around there. And like Alan said, I was really curious to know what the impact of the social host ordinance was because we considered that to be one of those social, cultural, environmental things we could do that would have an impact. And I'm very gratified to hear that you say it has had a big impact. A absolutely. I, I am on the, the listserv of some of the neighborhood associations, and I would read you know, their comments um, after a weekend or, or whatever has happened. And, um, you know, every single week there were several emails going around about the neighborhood and, and what's happened. And when the ordinance was introduced, it, it dropped dramatically. I, it was startling, uh, to be honest with you, how much has dropped. Um, now, we still have some of the emails, and, and rightly so, but the amount is a fraction of what it used to be. Um, and we do do what, everything that we can to make sure that students know coming onto campus. We use our, a group called Come University. Um, we use a lot of literature to let them know about the ordinance so they can make the right choice from the beginning. We're not saying don't have fun or don't have a party. We're just saying have a safe party, have a smart party. It's not worth it to, to lose your, um, the, the privilege of going to school at the University of Oregon or living in this community because of a party. So let's make sure you can do it the correct way. One other thing that reminded me, um, Councilman Pryor, that you brought up, reminded me that another thing that we're doing, and, and it's not always because of the, the campus safety issue, but it, it's related, is um, starting in 2017, all of our freshmen will live on campus. Um, they will not have a choice to live off campus. And the reason why we're doing that is because they are our highest risk population, especially during that first six weeks when they're on campus. And so we want to make sure that they are safe and secure in our residence halls. And so we have to build another residence hall before we can have enough room for them to live there, otherwise we would be rolling it out this year. Um, but by 2017, all the freshmen will be living here. And so, and as a city, I think, and as someone who lives in the city, we have to be very careful about the densities that are happening with the amount of student housing where, um, you know, we, we have a lot of students living in and around the city who uh, perhaps are not really ready to be doing that, which is why we took the step that we're going to take, which is to mandate all of our freshmen um, to live with us on campus. And so I guess the final point to make along this line is, as the university and the city together develop some strategies for how we can be more effective. Um, I would love to keep track of those strategies because they may be useful in other parts of town, sure. in other situations. I think you know social, cultural, environmental strategies uh, that work well in this relationship may be portable to other areas where it might not necessarily be a University of Oregon mm -hmm. student. Uh, but it may be a similar kind of issue that these strategies could work with. So I'm appreciative from that standpoint as well. It may have a larger benefit overall. So thank you very much. Thank you. Polling. Thank you. Yeah, this is kind of to follow up on what the mayor was saying about the university getting involved with the, the local school districts. Um, I, I realize that not all the kids in high school are going to go on to the University of Oregon or even college. But what I was hoping is that perhaps the university could do some outreach to the local school districts 
to maybe you know get some of the bright students you have involved in your program to sit down with with the school districts and, and maybe come up with some kind of a curriculum that's available to the high school students their senior year or their junior year that'll prepare them for life once mm -hmm. they leave high school and home mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be real beneficial and then the other thing is more of a question and I'm not quite sure of all the services that you provide mm -hmm. but are would it be possible or can you in the future see perhaps offering some of these services to victims that aren't university students but the perpetrator was is that a possibility that we can you know I mean there, there are things available to people in, in the, the criminal mm -hmm. justice system outside of the university but I think perhaps maybe extending that offer at least might might uh, tell the community in general that hey we are doing the best we can and these are some of the things and if one of these victims does want to take opportunity here at the university it's available mm -hmm. I can tell you uh, that when we have a report of, of a sexual assault or someone who is in need, um, it's not always the University of Oregon student. So it, it isn't uncommon that we are um, working with um, an LCC student, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it may involve, the perpetrator may be a U of O student. So that situation is a very realistic situation and, and does happen. And when that does happen, if we have, for example, one of our social workers who's responding to the report, you know, she's going to provide services and she's going to give referral information to that young person, whether they're a U of O student or they're an LCC student or any other type of, of student, and she's going to know what those referral sources are. Uh, we are limited in the types of services we can provide to non-matriculating students because we have insurance and those types of things that will not cover us to provide those services. So our physicians, our psychologists and counselors, they, they can only <laughs> provide services to those things that they have malpractice insurance and coverage to, in order to cover so that we cannot do that. But we can provide that really important referral information Information, getting them to the hospital if they need to get to the hospital or to the police department. We absolutely have been doing that and will continue um, to do that. Um, we do not advertise that. Um, we just do it because it's the right thing to do. The other thing is the uni university being in a, in a town or a city or state, we have to be, we're here for the common good. We're not just, we're not here for ourselves. And so I totally agree that we should be taking whatever services or programs that we think are effective and working and we should bring those to the high school. We have a lot of very eager students who really like to do service learning types of things and so as we perfect some of these programs that we're, we're doing we will you know scale them and give students opportunities as well as some staff and faculty opportunities to work in the the 4J school system because we do get a lot of 4J students coming here so that's going to help us but it's going to help our community and the university is a common good so we should be doing those types of things thank you very much that's yeah. brown thanks mayor uh thank you for the presentation um those uh, statistics were very very disturbing mm -hmm. um i'm just i just have a couple questions um what is the current enrollment of the university? It's a little bit over 24,000 students. 24, mm -hmm. okay. Is that, um, was there an increase this year over last year? Um, it, if it is, it's negligible, maybe about 200 students. I know there have been, mm -hmm. been modest declines the it, last two years. Right, it's right. 50 students one year and 200 the other. So it's, right. it's been pretty stable for mm -hmm. about three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I, you know, it's funny, the numbers aren't reflected in the map. I just, I'm a map guy, oh. I'm a number guy, and so I added up all the numbers on the map. And <laughs> the numbers on the map come to 14,000. Mm. So there's um, 10,000 10, missing students somewhere. on this map. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it really matters. It gives us the idea of the distribution. Mm -hmm. um, Can I every dog? And then you, you had mentioned Transport something system. earlier about, um, you know, things that the city could do to provide alternative activities mm -hmm. and I uh, what exactly did you have in mind well in, I mean did you have well in particular ideas? late night activities late night activities yeah. that are a mixture of things that a young person could do if they're under the age of 21 and late night activities they could do if they are over the age of, of 21 like I mentioned that's something that we definitely are really focusing on on the campus um, but there mm -hmm. needs to be more than that you know maybe yeah. they are doing they study till one or two in the morning and then they want to go do something else what what are they going to do or where are they going to go um, right. and so 
So I think more of those activities or activities that we partner on together, maybe maybe something starts, and we, there are some of those things that happen. Something starts at the university, but it continues within the city, other than just our sporting events, where we do a great job of partnering, but there's, there's more than just the sporting events, more activities yeah. that are geared toward people under the age of 21. Sorry to know exactly what that would be late at night, though. I mean, other than movies or concerts or... It'll, and the bars be... are closed at two, and but and you're right, students are up. I mean, I I went to the U of O for several years mm -hmm. and took a lot of language classes, and uh, I don't know how many of the old timers remember the mill race on Franklin, twenty four seven, Hoots twenty four seven. That was the hangout you would mm -hmm. go there, and you know, drink coffee and go to gut, go to gut. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so I. That, that's that's an interesting concept, but can't figure out what those activities are. No, I think, I think you're saying mostly what, what you're talking about. Students like to go to movies, so we actually do movie nights once a week that go to about 2 in the morning. Yeah. Um, you know, more of that in the city would be good, more concerts uh -huh. and those types of things and mm -hmm. gathering. Um, and in terms of the bars, you know, we do have some concerns, especially the bars that are close to campus. Yeah. Um, there's the, the way they serve and um, uh -huh. kind of the two-for-one drinks and bring a girl yeah, and get a drink. Yeah. Those types of things are yeah. very, very concerning yeah. to uh, so any help that we could have with um, making sure that the bars that are uh, especially close to the university are kind of following some, some common sense um, rules would be very nice. Um, many of our incidents uh, have some impetus that started with the bar. Someone was overserved, yeah. and then they end up going someplace that's else and something else happens. And it, so a lot of it starts Quite concerning that, yeah. to us. Yeah, that's, that's kind of an Oregon Liquor Control Board matter rather than Eugene police so they I know they do send people around to make sure that mm -hmm. the servers are doing a responsible job and uh, and things fall through the cracks mm -hmm. and bad things happen thanks here's a red yeah thank you thank you so much for coming today and um, really appreciate the level of commitment and depth that it looks like uh, the university has given to this subject and um, if it, I, I get the strong impression you've taken this very seriously and have dedicated a lot of resources to addressing it so um, that's very reassuring. I just had a few comments um, and then a question. So I'm very pleased to hear about the initiative to require freshmen students to live on campus. I think that is a very wise move and will definitely result in keeping students safe who might otherwise have not been. Um, I think that really demonstrates a level of commitment to this issue uh, in a tangible way. So I really want to appreciate that. I also uh, like the idea, as some of my fellow counselors mentioned, about reaching out to the local high schools. So just keep in mind there's also Bethel mm -hmm. uh, School District and Springfield as well would want to be part of that mix. Um, and I appreciate your suggestions about some, you know, thinking about some late night activities. Uh, in my ward, it's a, a little bit out of downtown, but we have the skate park and we talked at some point about whether we wanted to amend the rules there and let it be a 24-7 facility or we haven't quite gotten there yet, but, you know, there might be potential for activities there. I think as long as we are mindful about the potential impact on nearby neighbors, because as someone who lives in Whitaker with lots of uh, fun stuff going on, sometimes it can be a negative impact on a nearby neighbors. So, and I really appreciate you calling out the over-serving mm. at the bars as an issue. Um, I think that uh, leads to very dangerous situations. Um, and then my question is, uh, with all of the good education and outreach for uh, students before they even come to campus, how is that handled for international students who come from other cultures um, and who likely uh, speak English as their second language? And I ask that both in terms for those who might be victims as well as those who might be perpetrators. Right. Um, and we do have... Um, uh, we definitely have concerns and issues regarding our international populations that are coming in and trying to, you know, acclimate to another culture, um, and that's not easy. It wouldn't be easy for us if we were doing uh, the same thing, um, and so we, we definitely have programming that's geared um, toward those populations as well. Um, we have opportunities for um, if, if something needs to be interpreted in a different language, um, of course we will do that, but there is a expectation, um, and not just at the University of Oregon, but at any university you have to have some level of English proficiency in order to take classes and so because of that expectation they should be able to to manage you know the the online um, 
the online courses that we have, um, but we do have opportunities for them to have that in different languages if they actually need that or don't feel as though they're ready, they're ready to do that. But it is, it is a challenge because even though you might understand um, what a word says, you might not understand the nuances um, of that uh, very well. So we do work very closely with our International Affairs Office to make sure that those students are, are getting what they, what they need to have as well. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you. I wonder if anyone noticed we're mostly male here <laughs> around the table. <laughs> Is, uh, I, I think um, any woman probably has more knowledge of sexual assault than most men do um, if she's been alive and living, moving around. Um, I do think... Um, well, for something that we could do, and I've been saying this for years, and only people who ever agree with me are the ones who are running against me, but I've been saying we need a youth center. And every time I've had an opponent, that person starts saying we need a youth center downtown. And then once the election's over, they forget it. But I think it's something that the university and the city need to co and the school district need to cooperate on. I could see university students as being patrons of the youth center and also interns to help the younger people in, all, in any field you could imagine. So all we need is a philanthropist and the university willing to um, initiate something maybe with the city. Um, I think it's really good that you're having 24-hour opening of a union. Mm -hmm. And 24 hour, hour activities would be downtown too. I know from, I remember when sometimes even after you've studied really late, you just feel like staying up all night. Right. And I remember when that was really exciting to stay up all night and then go to breakfast. Mm -hmm. So if we had restaurants or some place to eat mm -hmm. at 5 a.m., it would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am conscious of the, of the need for due process also, and I wonder if, when you talk about sexual assault, does that include touching? Yes. Yeah. I think that's... So any unwanted contact. Sometimes I think that can be carried too far and people can be accused of something when they haven't really done anything that's dangerous. And I think there needs to be some kind of distinction. How about professors as, as what? perpetrators? Well, you know... Anyone can be a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, when we look at our statistics, the, the largest uh, group is student on student. Um, but there are, there are times in which our faculty at times are making bad decisions as well. But by far, the largest group are students. I'm sure, student. but I remember a time when, I don't talk, I'm not talking about anyone who was at that school at this time, but professors who are known to be um, dangerous, well, Hard to be, hard to, hard to um, accuse, and mm -hmm. hard to stay away from. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there are uh, expectations and policies that faculty and staff have to follow. Um, faculty and staff are all mandatory reporters of any mm -hmm. type of sexual harassment or sexual assault. And one thing I wanted to just um, perhaps push back a little bit on your comment about um, there being. Um, Things people are reporting things that aren't happening. Happening at our university and at other universities across the country, that really doesn't bear out. That people do not tend to falsify reports, um, and so that is something that's talked about a lot in the media. Um, but as as an institution, that we we get all those reports, we're investigating all those reports. And if I had to line them all up, and how many times someone falsified a, a report or it actually happens, it's way skewed on the side of that this is really something that that did happen. Now it. It is true that there are gradations of, of those types of unwanted contact, and so you want to address those issues properly. So maybe someone didn't understand or didn't know and they need to have education about that versus someone who is a perpetrator or has really um, done something egregious. And so our, our reaction is not the same. You know, we're not going to take a hammer on every single thing. So no. if it's education that person needs, then we do education with them. If it's that the person is dangerous and shouldn't be in our community, then we expel them from the university. But we need to be, um, I think, very sensitive to the fact that, that it takes a lot of different forms. Yes. Um, I know that people have, women have been accused of asking for it when they went to the dorm room. But um, I wasn't talking so much about wrong accusations as misinterpretation. Mm. I mean, an accidental touch. Mm. And when someone says, oh, the person touched me here, and that's 
Right. And that's what I meant by it, yeah. if we were to investigate something like that, then we would we would imagine that that would come out as something that was a misunderstanding mm -hmm. and not an actual, you know, unwanted experience. And not. so we would respond accordingly. Okay. I have known of people who were accused of something that I think was yes. not true, and it's very hard to disprove mm -hmm. sometimes. Another thing, I, I have one second. Uh, have you ever thought of it? What? That's it. I have one second left. Mm. Have you ever thought of keeping the library it open? Like, <laughs> it, the library, the library is open 24/5. Uh, oh, good. So I'm trying to transition us because we're into five minutes into our next topic. So I want to say I very much appreciate the conversation. Me too. I think it's really good for us, and I think it's really good for the community to be able to hear it at, as they watch these meetings. So thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you, Mayor. We appreciate it. Very thank, much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. You're we're going to transition as quickly as we can into the work session on science-based greenhouse gas target. Start when you're ready. All right. All right. Thank you. For those in the audience, I'm Babe O'Sullivan, the sustainability liaison for the city of Eugene. And I'm joined by my colleague, Matt McCray, our climate and energy analyst. We're back with you today to continue our conversation that we started in December about setting a new climate goal for the community, <laughs> one that is focused on capping greenhouse gas emissions at a level needed to limit global warming and to stabilize the climate. This is the second in a series of work sessions over the coming weeks that will lay the foundation for considering a new goal based on the concept of a community carbon budget, something you'll be hearing about quite a bit today. A carbon budget, like its financial equivalent, is an allowance. It reflects a finite, limited amount of carbon dioxide that we can safely emit into the atmosphere and prevent further climate disruption. What you'll be learning about is a new, better informed approach to setting climate action goals and represents an important opportunity for you to bring the best available science into our local planning efforts. So now I'm going to turn it over to Matt to walk you through more of the details. Thanks, babe. Um, as Babe mentioned, we were um, we had a conversation with you in December on this same topic, and we talked about the foundation of of the climate science. And today we'll pick up where that discussion left off. My aim is to take about 15 minutes to cover the information and leave the rest of the time for discussion. Um, after a brief presentation, I'll be looking to you for clarifying questions. And um, just FYI, we're not looking for a decision at this time. Um, I do have a few slides to help um, illustrate some of the ideas, so um, here we are. Um, I'm going to just really briefly review a couple of the climate science concepts that we discussed last time, and then I'll share with you the 350 budget concept, um, looking to help you and viewers understand the ideas and looking for clarifying questions. I'll then cover our plans to continue this discussion on the 350 target including the implications for Eugene, as well as other parts of the Climate Recovery Ordinance over the next couple of months. You've all seen this before, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly, but just as a recap for, for folks listening at home, the Climate Recovery Ordinance has a number of, um, of actions that are required. First, it clarifies and codifies existing goals. We have a goal to reduce community-wide fossil fuel use 50% by 2030, and a goal to make our city operations carbon neutral by 2020. It also calls for an assessment of current efforts, and we reported that back to you in February of last year. It calls for targets and benchmarks to achieve existing goals. We discussed that with you in, in November of 2015, and we have um, time scheduled to come back and, and revisit that with you to make uh, more decisions. Here's the focus of our discussion today. It calls for a development of a science-based community greenhouse gas reduction goal, so that's where we'll be focused. It also has two more um, specifics. It calls for regular progress reports to council, and it establishes a process of analysis, reporting, and readjustment if community or internal targets are not met. So um, recall from last time, you probably re recognize this slide. Um, this is just really brief overview of the carbon cycle, that, that carbon cycles um, from up in the atmosphere and into plants. It gets stored as um, 
in, in like the trunk, the trunks of trees, uh, and then when those trees burn or decay, the carbon dioxide goes back up into the atmosphere. It also gets stored in the soil and moves between the soil and the atmosphere, and then carbon also moves between the atmosphere and and the oceans and plants in the oceans. Uh, and what's interesting is that the amount of um, carbon cycling among plants, animals, in the ocean and air has remained stable over the last 10,000 years. But atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide increase when we burn fossil fuels. Um, so you'll see on the right-hand side of this slide um, that illustrated here auto and factory emissions where we, um, in the course of doing that, we, we dig up fossil fuels, um, carbon dioxide that's stored in underground storage, and we pull it to the surface and we burn it, putting that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and so that's what we're, really what we're talking about here. Um, what's interesting is that we can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's measured in parts per million. Right now there are 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, up from 280 just 100 years ago. So this, again, is a result of digging up that buried carbon and adding it to the atmosphere by burning it. So here's the chart of that um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. On the left-hand side is 1960, on the right-hand side is 2015, and we can see the steady increase in carbon dioxide as we continue to add carbon um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the, the scale is in parts per million, as I just mentioned, that's how it's measured. Um, and we can see, and I'm going to see if I can hit it here with lasers, so there's about uh, where 350 parts per million are. We've already passed that level. We'll talk more about that later. Um, what's important to recall is that scientific research tells us that increased amount of carbon dioxide result in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere results in warmer average global temperatures. We talked about that in our last um, in our last discussion. So we've already experienced warming due to this increase in carbon dioxide. The concern is that if we warm much further, we're likely to experience even greater amounts of warming due to feedbacks. And we talked about feedbacks last time as well. Um, natural processes in the climate system that affect the speed and amount of warming. The most concerning are those that magnify the speed of warming. Take, for example, reduced Arctic sea ice. As the area of Arctic ice shrinks, the white ice that reflects the sunlight back into space is replaced by dark ocean that absorbs that sunlight and turns it into heat, causing further warming of the ocean that further melts the ice in a, in a reinforcing cycle. And as we talked about last time, there are multiple reinforcing feedbacks like this one. So you've seen this before. It's just a reminder of why we're focused on the 350 target, because that amount of CO2 in the atmosphere would largely avoid these feedbacks. So 350 parts per million is where the carbon, carbon budget comes in. So really briefly, what is a carbon budget? Uh, again, recall from our last session that greenhouse gas emissions stay in the atmosphere for decades to centuries. So reducing emissions in any one year is not really the focus. Rather, reducing total cumulative emissions over the long term is the only way to effectively um, avoid warming feedbacks. So a carbon budget is a budget is a total amount of carbon emissions that can be released over time while still remaining within a safe limit, in this case 350 parts per million, as identified as the concentration that is expected to limit warming to just one degree over pre-industrial temperatures. So the budget is based on total cumulative greenhouse gas emissions released since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and extends to the year 2100. Keep in mind we'll be looking at Eugene's piece of a global budget, and, and that'll be based on our population. So. Um, Last year, uh, we set to work to develop a carbon budget for Eugene, and it's provided us with an opportunity w to work with a number of experts in this field. It really has been a um, pretty, pretty interesting process, and the timing really couldn't have been better. At the same time we were developing a carbon budget for Eugene, leaders from across the globe met in Paris and embraced the same idea, that we need a definitive carbon budget if we're to meet our goal of maintaining a stable climate. The charge to develop a 350 carbon budget for Eugene led us to climate scientists at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and Columbia University. Climate scientists there have created a global carbon budget that was our starting place. We used that global carbon budget and downscaled it for Eugene based on our population. Along the way, we re received special support from the American Geophysical Union, who teamed us up with a physicist from Portland State University who could help us work on this. 
a few key points to make here. The carbon budget is new. It's a different way um, that we and other a different. It's different from the way we and others have set greenhouse gas targets in the past. It's tailored. It has been scaled to fit Eugene and the specific carbon impacts of our community. And our methods have been reviewed by a number of experts in the field. We worked with representatives from Portland State University, Stockholm Environment Uni uh, Institute, the Oregon uh, State of Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, the City of Portland, and the University of Oregon. We've really had um, a bunch of help to make sure we're getting this right. Over the course of the work, we've been able to learn more about the benefits of a carbon budget approach. Uh, importantly, it aligns with the best available science. It also tells us what is necessary to achieve a stable climate and avoid dangerous feedbacks, as I just mentioned. It accounts for those emissions already released and focuses on the total accumula accumulation of emissions, not just what's being emitted today, so that we can be confident we're on the right track. It provides us clarity about our community role and removes the guesswork about how much is enough. And it's a fixed amount, so it allows us flexibility in how we use our community-wide budgets. So it's important to make a uh, distinction between the typical greenhouse gas reduction targets and a carbon budget. All communities have greenhouse gas. Re all communities that have greenhouse gas reduction goals have used this conventional method that I'm going to illustrate on the left. Whereas the carbon budget is based on the impact of cumulative emissions, as I had mentioned, and best available science. So here are the distinctions. Conventional greenhouse targets look at incremental decreases over time, and a carbon budget looks at it is based on total cumulative emissions. Conventional targets are measured reduction over time, so you might see something like 75% reduction by 2050. Where a carbon budget is, is a fixed one-time allocation, and in our case, it's 9.3 million metric tons of CO2. Conventional targets are set based on historic rate of emissions and are, frankly, a, a little bit arbitrary. Um, they're, they're based on, on, on historic rates and, and not calibrated to what's necessary. Where a carbon budget is looking forward and set to achieve a safe level of CO2 and science-based. Conventional targets, like this one, 75% reduction from 1990 levels is a, is a common um, baseline. Uh, and, and a carbon budget is more focused on 350 parts per million and one degree C of warming. And finally, uh, the conventional targets based, like this 1990 level, is based on a negotiated target from Kyoto Protocol uh, in 1992. So it's based on 25-year-old science and not up to date with our current understanding of emissions where the carbon budget is based on the best available science of today. So in short, it's a new way of setting a goal. And now we'll talk about where the discussion goes from here. Um, we're going to be coming back to you several times over the next several months. As we indicated early on, our first priority was to focus on internal operations, emissions, and goals. We discussed that with you. And we're now working on community-wide goals, and so you'll be hearing from, from us more frequently as we focus our our, um, shift our focus to the external. In the next couple months, we'll continue the conversation, including what a 350 target means for Eugene, and we'll have an opportunity to hear from some of the experts we've consulted with, including Angus Duncan, Duncan who's the chair of the Oregon Global Warming Commission. Uh, in, in May, we'll discuss with you, um, bring an update on the internal goals in city operations. In June, we'll have a conversation about uh, possible action on numerical targets and benchmarks, and then in fall we'll come back to you with a progress report. A uh, couple final points. Uh, as you are all considering actions, there will be opportunities for residents to weigh in. And in order to support these conversations, and based on the feedback from the Sustainability Commission, we've refreshed our website to make the information about the Climate Recovery Ordinance more easily accessible. So that's all I have for you today. There are questions about the carbon budget concept. Thank you for that presentation, and it sure. uh, really feels like we're getting our our uh, flight pattern in, in, in place, and I appreciate that. Um, I've got Chris and I've got Betty. Um, um, I was going to say something else, but it just went out of my head, so that's okay. 
and Councillor Pryor. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the presentation a lot, and I really like where you're going with regard to the notion of the carbon budget. Um, I think it, it really addresses the actual thing we're trying to achieve, the actual solution, which is to reduce um, emissions, carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere. And when we talk a lot about fossil fuel use, that's like a step removed from the actual solution we're trying to achieve, and it might also limit some of the strategies that we might have in place. And the example I would use is, um, I grew up in a state that had mandatory vehicle emissions testing. You couldn't get your certification to drive unless your vehicle passed an emission test. Um, and I'm not necessarily proposing that at the local level. It would be very difficult to enforce at a local level, but it would definitely be something we would want to consider as a, as a state. Um, I know California does it, New York does it, a number of countries do it. It's becoming more and more popular. The carbon budget idea, I think, feeds into that because the goal of mandatory emission testing is to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide be, to being emitted. And not to say, I'm going to force you to reduce your use use of gasoline by a certain amount, whether your car is efficient or not, um, it says, I want to reduce the amount of particulates being emitted into the atmosphere. And if your car is a high efficiency car, then you can drive that car. That's fine. Um, we have managed to successfully reduce our carbon budget. And so I think those kinds of strategies may be ways for us to address the goal without creating something that's, and I don't want to just talk about the word popularity, we know it's not going to be popular, but is actually workable or realistic rather than something that might be um, less flexible and, and more restrictive. So I like where you're going with the carbon budget. To me, it seems to focus more on the goal rather than some sort of, of percents and mechanisms at the other end. And as you mentioned before, it's based on old technology. It's based on an old way of thinking. And I like the new way of thinking um, because it provides us a lot more opportunity to get creative. So that's just one idea. I'm sure there's many other ones that we could think of that fit more appropriately within the notion of a carbon budget. So uh, I, like, I like where this is going, and I look forward to knowing how you flesh it out into more effective strategies that we can begin to implement both at the local, regional, and state level. Mr. Taylor? Thank you. Um, yes, the goals are good, and I, I like those, but I, I would like to know more about what specifically we can do, what we're going to do. I think that's what people keep asking us is, what are you going to do about this? And we know that we need to reduce the carbon. We know all of that, but, but what are we going to do? And I, about auto emissions, as I've mentioned before, El Rapa has discussed mandatory checks of automobiles, and we aren't getting anywhere. I don't know if we ever will or not, but I wonder what your opinion of that is. And the other thing, and you can address these all at once if you want, the other thing is um, we have delayed over and over dealing with a tree ordinance, which was remanded at some time, and what do you think about protecting trees as carbon, reduction, carbon sequestration? I know that some people will say, well, we, we replant trees, but a little stick doesn't do anything, whereas the big trees are, I think, really valuable. And so I'd like to know what you think about trees, auto emissions, and, and more specific things that we can tell people and actually do. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with your first question first, that want to know more about what we're going to do, and certainly that's going to be a focus of some of these upcoming conversations that we plan to have with you. Um, there's a lot there. Um, there are resources that we have, you know, we have to help us think about this. Um, we've applied for a project um, with, um, with Rocky Mountain Institute to help us do some thinking about this. Don't know yet if we've received that. Um, and I'll, I'll just, just as a quick reminder, we do have a climate and energy action plan that while it's not calibrated to get us to 350 parts per million, that, that level of reductions, it really largely lays out pretty much all of the strategies that we would take. The strategies aren't radically different or aren't likely to be radically different from those strategies that are in the Climate and Energy Action Plan. It's really just the pace with which we implement them. Um, there are a lot of things that we're doing here uh, locally. Um, yeah, the, the the list is long, and we've we've talked about them in in previous meetings. Um, but everything from the, the efforts that are happening in tr in our transportation 
program department to um, you know to make it easier for people to get around in using bikes and 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 walking um, the the construction right now of the MX route is you know has a huge potential to reduce the amount of emissions that we're seeing locally so those are just a couple examples there are certainly more uh, the work that eWeb is doing on behalf of Eugene residents to help people make their homes um, more efficient uh, is, is another example um, Yes, we absolutely need to do more, and we're going to have some more conversation about exactly what that looks like, um, but then that will come in a future session. Um, regarding auto emissions, we actually have um, examples here in Oregon where it's implemented at the community scale. Portland has it, and, then, and I believe Medford, if I'm not mistaken, has uh, mandatory emissions, so it's not in, implausible to do it at a sub-state level. Um, it hasn't been used where uh, where a local government has opted in to do that. It's it, all those cases that exist right now are because the state is requiring those areas to have um, emissions testing exactly because their their air quality is too poor. Um, we have really relatively very good air quality, and so we just aren't meeting a threshold to require that. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't, if we wanted to, opt into that program. Uh, it would undoubtedly reduce emissions. Um, there are certainly plenty of vehicles that drive around Eugene and Springfield that are not as efficient as they could be if they were tuned up and better cared for. Is that a big piece? It's hard to say. I don't know what the change in overall efficiency. You know, but if it's five percent increase in efficiency in half of our vehicles, that's something, and it's a piece of the silver buckshot. So it's something to to consider um, regarding the tree ordinance and carbon sequestration. Um, I've actually worked on this front with partners um, across the whole West Coast thinking about our urban forests and how it relates to climate change. In fact, um, city manager uh, did a beautiful job opening up a, a large conference on that topic last year. Um, regarding sequestration, yes, it's my sense that overall the amount of trees that we have in town are probably fairly static. We can bump up that number. Um, but whether that becomes significant in terms of carbon sequestration, I'd say compared to our regional forests, it's probably um, very, very minor. I would say that more important than the carbon sequestration in those trees is that we have trees that make our community beautiful and, and a place that people want to live and, and so that more people live in town instead of spreading out of town. And then we reduce the amount of driving and transportation that we have to um, that people have to do. So it makes it easier for people to live in a place that's a little more compact where they have better access to stuff, but it's a place they want to live because it's got a really beautiful urban forest. Thank you. I, I think that however much it is, however, however much auto, reducing auto emissions would contribute is important to do. No doubt. Personally. Yeah. And I th think that we could, as a city, could urge El Rapa to do something perhaps. They, they will discuss it, but, and we've had people come and speak to El Rapa about it too. People who've been driving behind things with smoke coming out. And I, th I think it's one thing we sh I think we should consider everything no matter how small. Agreed. As for, and I assume you'll be suggesting if there are things that we can do by ordinance, you'll be suggesting things. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. At least, at least policy. Yeah, directions. And I agree that urban forests, I mean, the, the, uh, the non-urban forests are really important, but that's important to consider when and if we talk about expanding the urban growth boundary. Thank Agreed. you. Sure. Um, Claire. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I always sure. appreciate the way you explain things for us so that we, those of us who are not technically minded can grasp them and understand them pretty easily. Um, I'm just picking up on the tree uh, uh, discussion, I would assume also our trees provide shade canopy, which reduces our need to use air conditioners and other Absolutely. Yep. kinds of um, power. So that's another positive for our older trees. Um, so I was very impressed with the caliber of uh, expertise that you've drawn upon to get to uh, bring this work, I think, really lifting it to the next level. So um, I really want to congratulate you on that. And I really appreciated the explanation between the conventional kind of reduction framework and the budget framework. That um, is good insight and I think um, a powerful way to think about the problem and how to tackle it. Um, and I also appreciate you guys taking, uh, putting some effort into 
updating the website and keeping that up to date. Because as you know, we have many folks in the community who are really interested in how we're making progress on this. And I think the easier we can make it for them to stay up to date and even contribute, the better off we're all going to be with this work. Um, I have been asked by Councillor Zelinka to serve on um, a task force that he's putting together to help support this work, so I'm eager to um, get that started and to learn more and to be able to contribute more intelligently to this conversation than I've been able to so far um, by getting more education. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Councillor Zelinka. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for the presentation. Um, there are different types of, of reduction goals that we could adopt. There are multiple different kinds of lines. The carbon budget is, of course, a, a new one. And uh, I don't, Matt, I don't know if there's anybody that's actually adopted, certainly not at the state level, a carbon budget uh, approach. Has there been? Not that I've seen. I believe that the state of Washington has been asked to do so. Um, but I, and I'd have to get the details on on that. But n not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So uh, it's it's kind of cutting edge. So it's it's something that um, most people haven't got to yet. W one of the problems with that approach is that we've already blown by 350 parts per million. We're above 400. Um, and uh, to uh, uh, to to have a carbon budget to get us to 350 parts per million if we were to adopt that today would have a, a very, very, very steep line going to basically almost zero carbon budget for the community by 2020. Uh, problem with that is uh, it's almost worse to uh, uh, have a target that most people believe is unachievable than it is to have no target at all. Um, and uh, so my current thinking is that uh, that what we really need to do is adopt a long-term goal of getting to 350 parts per million, but also, or, or maybe 400, or maybe 450, depending on that, how that conversation goes, um, and, and to have a short-term goal. And the short-term goal looks more like what we've seen at, at the state level, like the, and, it, and the state reduction goal line is pretty, coincident very close to our adopted goal of 50 percent reduction of fossil fuel community wide by 2030 those two lines are almost the same so that could be our, our short-term goal over the next several years with the long-term vision of getting to 350 parts per million um, by 2100 and uh, so the other point I wanted to make was that um, that where that the the gap between our business as usual, where we would be without any actions, and where we need to be, uh, is a is a big gap, and it gets filled in by actions at the global level, the federal level, the state level, and at the local level. But it doesn't mean that we have to do everything to get to that line. There's a lot of things that'll happen outside of the, our local uh, efforts to get us there. In fact, most everything that would be done will be done at that low level. So it'll involve us promoting those things and making sure that they happen at the at the global, federal, and state level. But then we have to figure out what is our share of that. And that's kind of difficult and complicated, and we need to work on that to get there. Um, and our, our climate action plan has strategies in it, but it's uh, uh, not an action-specific plan, uh, and uh, it's just not specific enough. And, and more importantly, it doesn't it's not based on uh, which actions are the most cost effective because you haven't done that detailed analysis to get there. Uh, and that's something that we need to do, get to do that analysis on specific projects in specific areas. So uh, another concern that I have is how do you do a community-wide plan when it's us saying this is what we need to do, how does that get implemented at the community level, which is uh, actually kind of complicated. Uh, um, and then the round could. Um. I, I did want to clarify because I saw uh, some wondering in the work group that uh, Claire was mentioning um, that I asked Alan to put together is a mayor's group. So but that, that I have that power to do that in our in our charter, and I wanted to make sure that it was clear. Okay, and the other thing that I wanted to say before I go back to Alan is uh, I wanted to take a moment and appreciate Babe for the work she's done for our city. She's leaving us. I think we have a, in a couple weeks, right? 
You have six days left. Six days left. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, on the part of all of us, to uh, express our appreciation for the really hard work you've done and uh, how much is what a pleasure it's been working with you. So I just want to honor that. Thank you. Okay. Ron. Yeah, I did want to touch on that, the, the ad hoc committee that the mayor's ad hoc committee on this uh, and, and working through kind of how it should be put together. Um, but uh, it's mo most of the focus is going to be on uh, reporting and communications and how that can be done better. One of the things when I wrote the uh, climate recovery ordinance, put in a reporting requirement that we report back every two years. Uh, and obviously that's insufficient. Uh, after two years goes by, it seems like an eternity and having some kind of uh, regular feedback conversation about what's happening and how we report that and maybe even on the website is, is a uh, uh, is topic of that conversation. For instance, there is a, an enormous amount of things that the city has already done over the last year and back and is planning to do that will help us move that but we're not we don't have a place or an ability to communicate that um, and so it looks like mm, we're not doing anything until two years comes around and then we and then we end up saying oh here's where we are uh, so th that's a, a kind of a big problem and also that whole notion of, of how do you do a community plan and implement it and how do you involve the community to get on board with moving it forward so that's a topic that's being struggled with with uh, numerous communities. Corvallis, for instance, is doing one. I know Babe went and talked to their, I mean, uh, Matt talked to their task force the other day uh, about how the, how you do this at a community level when, you know, the city only has a certain amount of authority and, and powers of persuasion, but how do you get the whole community involved in moving forward and what does that look like? Um, so that's a big part of, uh, you, could, you first have to set the goal, but then you have to figure out how do you, how do you get there and how do you involve the community and how do you get buy-in to get get everybody moving that direction. And again, a lot of it happens at the global federal state level, and then there's the local community actions that need to occur as well. So um, those are kind of the things that we'll be working on. And uh, I, I told the mayor that I would get her back a, a, a more formal written proposal uh, very quickly. So um, before we wrap this up, I just want to say, and I know that you probably are thinking about this, but as we're trying to, to achieve these goals, I think we have to use that uh, TBL and really understand how the decisions we make are impacting other things, especially the social equity piece in my view, because um, in that case, even in the discussion about vehicles, it becomes really problematic for people who are very low income who are uh, driving around uh, junkers to, uh, um, to be able to make those kind of decisions they, may, they might make if they had different resources available. So I don't know how we'll tackle that, but it's a real reality that for those who have means, it's an easier way to make, it's easier to make those kinds of decisions than it is for folks who are not of means. And we have to take bear that. In. That's not to get an excuse, but it is to say, you, you're going to have to think about that hard and figure out how we do, do the best we can for everybody. Okay. Thank you all very much. Anything else? All right. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.